Well, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to the seminar. Uh, please welcome Dr. Lakana Sabane or um, to to uh, the demystifying medicine uh, webinar series. Uh, Dr. Um, the Bain is a professor of uh, biostatistics and former interim chair and associate chair of the Department of Health Research Methods, Evidence and Impact um, at McMaster University. He's also the director of biostatistics at Joseph St. Joseph's Healthcare Hamilton. He's, uh, his international reputation uh, has led him to be honored by many professional societies um, related to health research methodology, including the International Statistical Institute, the American Statistical Association, and the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences. He also received the 2020 Anne and Mac Neil MacArthur Annual Research Award. Dr. Uh, Thabine is the editor-in-chief of the journal uh, Pilot and Feasibility Studies, and he is a member of the editorial board for many journals, including Trials and Clinical Trials. As a senior biostatistician and methodologist, he has led many clinical trials and co has co-authored nearly 800 peer-reviewed manuscripts, leading to significant contributions and transformation of science, healthcare, and delivery of care in many clinical areas. Having mentored over 100 graduate students and junior faculty, Dr. Thabane has won several teaching and mentorship awards for his commitment to building capacity in health research and nurturing the next generation of researchers. Please do note that this uh, webinar will be um, has a moderated Q&A session at the end. So if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A section. And with that being said, I'll, I'll pass it over to our speaker today. All right. Thank you. Thank you for a very kind introduction. And thanks to Dr. As for inviting me to be part of this session and uh, me and also helping with uh, the technical issues. All right, so many of you would have seen this um, last year was a paper published, I think probably about January of 2019. Um, we're now in 2021, so it's been almost more than a year since it was published. It was signed up by more than 800 people who wanted to retire the poor statistical significance. And I'll come back to this article as we go through. What am I going to share with you today? The connection between statistical thinking and evidence-based practice, EBP means evidence-based practice. A little bit of history of uh, statistical significance or p-values as we know them in science and some of the practical challenges that we face with the uh, statistical significance or using thresholds for p-values when we actually do science. And then I'll go back to the ongoing debate that was stimulated by that article and perhaps uh, figure out what other things we can do with statistical significance in the time being, because I don't think it's gonna be easy to change practice. Now, ultimately I'll conclude with some remarks of why you as a junior scientist or someone who is dedicating uh, their future to um, providing care or uh, using evidence to provide care, why you should care, right? So this is George Wells. Many people think of him as the father of science. In statistics, uh, we know him for something else. So who is George Wells? He was actually born in England and um, lived in England until he died, but he was a journalist um, and a novelist and made, wrote you know, lots of other notable books. Um, but in statistics, we know him for making a daring prediction. I quote him, statistical thinking will someday be as necessary for efficient citizenship as the ability to read and write. We all know that this is uh, one of the most fundamental uh, skills that any citizen can have. Uh, so what is statistical thinking? Quite often we see things and when we see things with your eyes, we can describe them, we can describe our thoughts. And essentially, even when we do science, we first start by observing things and then describing what we observe. And then we wonder about the phenomena um, or mechanism that would have generated the information we're observing. And, and then try to see whether, you know, do we, should we worry about the quality was the relevance? Uh, could there be alternative explanation that explain what we're seeing? And then does this really match what we would expect? And quite often because in science, we tend to think about hypotheses and so on, and we benchmark our observations based on those hypotheses and so on. 
So statistical thinking really in health is nothing about advancing the welfare of society through research, which is really optimal use of information to plan, diagnose, prevent, treat, or manage health conditions. Really, when you think about it, therefore, statistical thinking is nothing else but evidence-based thinking. With the arrival of COVID, this has truly uh, become true in, in all respects, because now evidence-based thinking is in every nation and every citizen is actually expected uh, to be able to consume information in a way that's actually helpful. We see that every citizen around the world is expected to understand what it means to flatten the cap. We've seen caps like this or diagrams like this displayed on TV, on the news, everywhere where you read about information that um, if we do A, B, C, D, we can flatten the cap and everybody is expected to behave in a particular way to be able to flatten the cap. We also heard about bending the cap all of which um, are really uh, flooding um, you know, uh, uh, media, whether it's through TV, social media, or other ways. And the intent is very simple to try and figure out really how we can change our behaviors to save our own species from this virus. We've also seen citizens bombarded with uh, evidence and illustrations of really how many of the interventions that um, are being advocated by our public health officials actually work. And all this is really, they intended to really help us to be able to be better consumers of information, which is really nothing else but statistical thinking at play. So suddenly statistics has become a necessary aspect of advancing our own survival, really, which is uh, trying to protect us from this virus. However, the reality is we can't really appreciate the clinical relevance of any evidence unless we also adopt statistical thinking in how we collect, synthesize, and of course, interpret or apply that evidence in practice. In many cases, one would argue that one of the most important things we need is practical or pragmatic trial evidence. There's um, a lot of um, empirical evidence showing that in many settings, uh, people tend to be doing things that are really not supported by um, pragmatic evidence um, in routine settings. And this is not only happening in developing countries, but it's happening in a lot of uh, areas in clinical medicine, even in Canada. The second thing that we often have to deal with is the barriers of translating what we know to work best uh, into practice and uh, get people to do it uh, consistently. And this is because there's so many things we have to deal with, many of which are really uh, the biases that have to do with how information is reported, how there's usually um, issues of spinning the information, which often leads to in, in, inappropriate or incorrect interpretations of information and so on. And I'll come back to this issue as we go through uh, the talk. Let me just stop a bit and take you back to the beginning of p-values or statistical significance as we know it today. This is R.A. Fisher. Um, many people think of him as the father of modern medicine um, and at one point described as a genius who almost single-handedly created the foundations of modern statistical science. Now, let me remind you again that really when you think about statistics as a discipline, many of the people who really are the pillars or the founders of the discipline were not statisticians. This is Reverend Thomas Bayes and we have a whole field called Bayesian statistics named after him. He was just an enthusiast um, of statistics as a pastor, but ultimately we have the entire field named after him. Fisher himself was not a statistician. He was a geneticist and he used statistics as a tool to be able to help solve his problems in genetics. And Carl Pearson was a lawyer um, uh, who just loved mathematics. And of course, there's a very close relationship and connection between statistics and mathematics uh, so perhaps you can see how himself was much, much closer to statistics than the other two. Australia, and you know, worked with many people, including Charles Darwin uh, and Carl Pearson himself. Um, so one of the things that um, Fisher did was to write a book. Um, you know, he was really doing lots of experiments. And in that book, he states that the value for which P is equal to 0.05 or one in 20 
is about 1.96 or nearly two, it is convenient to take this point as a limit in judging whether a deviation is to be considered significant or not. This was the beginning of the introduction of the term significant in, in science, uh, which was actually coming out for the first time from uh, Fisher's book. He went on to actually advocate that, um, you know, one could actually use this threshold of 0 0.05 as the standard level for concluding that the evidence against some null hypothesis being tested uh, is uh, significant and so on. But he also warned people that this should not be used as an absolute rule. And I think it is the latter that people often forget when they actually apply this. In fact, if you actually read closely what you wrote about this, he provided an entire spectrum of how one could interpret a P value between zero and one, which is the region uh, where P is actually defined. He said, if it's between 0 0.1 and 0.9, there's certainly no reason to suspect the hypothesis. If it's below 0 0.02, it is strongly indicated that the hypothesis fails to account for the whole of the facts we shall not often be astray if we draw a conventional uh, line at 0 0.05. So really he, he provided interpretation across the entire spectrum, but people just focused on one uh, that he called the conventional line of 0 0.05. Unfortunately, that's how alpha of 0 0.05 was then introduced in statistical science as a criterion to judge statistical significance. And almost every science who does experiments uh, or who collects evidence to try and figure out what works and what doesn't work, they use this alpha as threshold for assessing the significance of the evidence. And this has pretty much become ritualistic in medical research, which is um, really what brought us here today. Now, some people have argued that this accept reject philosophy of significance testing based on this alpha barrier remains dominant in the minds of non statisticians. Now, this is Stuart Pocock, one of the most famous statisticians in England. Um, but honestly, I suggest that the blame doesn't just stay with non-statisticians. It goes to both statisticians and non-statisticians alike. The reason being non-statisticians are taught by and they collaborate with statisticians who tend to also propagate the same type of thinking. So what are the practical challenges with statistical significance or p-value thresholds as they are currently being applied in practice? First, an overwhelming number of uh, research papers that are published, and this is John Ianidis, he actually found that it was over 90% of published articles. They report p-values less than this threshold. And however, many of these claims um, are actually representations of false positive findings. And unfortunately, this is one of those things that is so prevalent, as you can see, it's over 90%. Uh, that it has become a problem. The other thing was that statistical significance uh, or lack of it is often interpreted as absence of evidence. This is uh, Doug Altman and Martin Blunt. Um, unfortunately, the guy on the right, Doug Altman, passed away a few years ago. They have always warned people that absence of evidence is not the same as uh, evidence of absence. You might wonder why because underpowered studies will often yield results that are not statistically significant. And I'll show you an example. This is a study that was looking at a combination of ACI and ARB therapy, whether it should be continued or discontinued uh, for patients with renal insufficiency. So if you look at the last column that provides you the odds ratio, uh, which is uh, whether there's risk reduction if you continue versus if you discontinue, it's about 40% relative risk reduction. But if you look at the p-value is 0.016. So obviously when you look at 41 relative risk reduction, it seems to be very large. And in fact, that on absolute risk uh, scale, it's about 7.5%, which may be viewed as clinically important. But the result is not statistically significant. And the reason is very simple. The sample size is too small leading to a fewer number of events and has very limited statistical power to be able to detect the statistical significance. Although the result itself showing a relative reduction of 41%, it's highly clinically relevant. Now, this issue is only useful if it's very, very prevalent in research. Um, if it's a very rare phenomenon, we don't need to worry about it. So the issue then becomes how common 
are clinically relevant results or findings um, that are really clinically meaningful, but they don't actually have statistical significance. This was a study done in cardiology to try and answer exactly that question using cardiovascular trials. So they looked for cardiovascular trials that were published, but, and then they looked at how many of those did not have a statistically significant finding on the primary outcome. It was about 72% of them. 92 out of 127 of those cardiovascular trials did not have a result. Uh, I mean, they had a result that was not statistically significant. And 61% of the 92 actually had an estimate that actually included a confidence interval that would include a clinically meaningful region or area. So that tells you that really uh, having findings that are not statistically significant, but clinically important, it's very, very common in practice. Cardiovascular uh, trials is not the only area where this happens. It happens in a lot of clinical disciplines uh, or clinical settings, which is why most reporting guidelines, uh, they often really want people to justify the sample size in the methods section as part of designing studies to avoid this problem. You really want to avoid uh, missing a clinically important difference if it exists, uh, so that um, when you have statistical significance, it is not happening by chance. The SPIRIT guideline for reporting of uh, protocols for trials recommends this uh, as an important element. And if you look at all the other reporting guidelines for trials, for observational studies, um, they all recommend really justifying how information was determined before the study is done in order to be able to rule out getting statistical significance by chance or rule out missing important um, effects when they exist. In short, p-values from underpowered trials are difficult to interpret. And the reason why they're difficult to interpret because you need to understand the sampling context. This is Tom Fleming uh, from the University of Seattle uh, who often reminds people that it's important that you really justify how much information you need to collect before you do a study so that p-values can be interpretable. You can also go on the other side. Underpowered studies will always lead to statistical significance. I mean, overpowered studies will always lead to statistically significant findings that have no clinical relevance. This is another example where, as you can see, we had over 4,000 patients in each of the two groups, in the placebo group and in the statin plus uh, stimib uh, group. And you're comparing the risk ratio, the risk ratio is there's about, um, you know, 17% relative risk reduction. And the result is highly significant. But if you look at the number needed to treat, you would have to actually treat 48 people to get one benefit. Uh, so which may really not be that helpful. But when you look at this on the relative risk, you might actually think 17% is actually good, which is why it's not really that useful to look at results on the relative risk scale. You should look at them on the absolute risk difference which is about 2.1%, it is not that much. So this may not be viewed as being clinically relevant, but if you look at the statistical significance, it has a very, very small p-value, which shows very, very strong statistical significance, right? Now, this is Mike Walsh, one of our colleagues at St. Joe's. A few years ago, he um, and I um, and other people, we worked on a study where we we're trying to show that statistical significance could actually uh, lead to many trials becoming very fragile. And therefore reliance on statistical significance is not really helpful. So what does fragility of a trial really mean? Consider a trial in which you're comparing two interventions, A and B, and you find that the results based on the test of significance of the effect is very significant. The p-value is less than 0.05. Now, the treatment of interest is A, if I move um, F number of people from A, non-event to event, the issue is how many people will I need to move in order to reverse the statistical significance. The more people I have to move to be able to do that, we say the trial is less fragile. If it takes a smaller number of people to move to reverse the statistical significance, we say the trial is very fragile. So you can see that higher values of the number of patients you have to move really lead to less fragile results. Now, this was done in several uh, trials in different disciplines. This was in anesthesiology trials, uh, 
This was done in orthopedic trials. It was done in spine surgery, emergency medicine. This was uh, ischemic stroke, this hemorrhage stroke, and this was ophthalmology. All shoulder trials done in these disciplines are incredibly fragile. It doesn't take much to actually change um, the statistical significance of the clinical finding. In fact, one of my summer students last year actually looked into this issue to try and find out what is the average fragility index across all clinical disciplines where this issue has been looked at. And he found that the average is actually four. It takes only four patients to reverse statistical significance. And we all know that many people, once they hear that something is statistically significant, they think it's actually useful. The other thing is p-values are routinely misinterpreted and it's because people really don't really understand how to interpret p-values. We often hear um, you know, interpretations such as, oh, this means there's no effect or the effectiveness of one treatment did not differ from that of another treatment or there's no difference in outcomes. These are all really poorly worded or uh, misinterpretations of p-values. And the issue that is why well, continue to rely on something that is clearly hard for people to understand and they continue to misinterpret it. Six, reliance on statistical significance tend to promote unethical practices in the conduct of science through what we call p-hacking. And there's lots of evidence showing that p-hacking is widespread in the literature, including in medical and health sciences. So you might wonder, what is p-hacking? It's when we collect, select, or perform statistical um, analysis until the result that it is not significant becomes significant. So we could collect lots of data, we could select some data and leave others out or perform different types of statistical analysis. And what we are trying to do is to be able to ultimately get statistical significance. There's various ways we could do this. Collect more data until you get significance. Collect and analyze data, but only re report only those that are significant. Or we can select some variables until you get significance. Or we can exclude some patients um, until you get significance. If none of these things work, ask a statistician to transform the data for you. Those transform the data and then you can get significance. The unfortunate consequence of this type of practice is that it makes it incredibly difficult for us to reproduce or replicate what others have done because People who tend to engage in this type of thing, uh, whether knowingly or unknowingly, they don't often provide all the details of what they did. So it becomes incredibly difficult to replicate science. We all know that one of the fundamental principles of science is replication uh, for us being able to reproduce what others have done. Seven, now the desire to um, you know, produce or find significant findings is partly responsible for research mis misconduct. If you look at retractions um, due to you know, false data or fabrications and so on, you'd often that many of those things actually, um, they were reporting findings that were statistically significant. And it is all this push um, of people to publish or perish that really ends up uh, getting them to do things that they wouldn't normally do. So. Um, you know, you just have to follow retraction watch. Uh, you will see that this has really become a real problem. And institutions, of course, have conflict of interest in cleaning up this behavior because they tend to benefit from the glory that comes to institutions where their scientists actually get all the media coverage. Now, some of you who have done uh, systematic reviews or may have um, worked with people who do systematic reviews, you may have had the word publication bias which is really the propensity for journals to only publish uh, studies that show statistical significance. Uh, by definition, this exists only because of p-value threshold or statistical significance. So this is actually a major problem. Now, if you think about it, the Cochrane collaboration is perhaps the gold standards of doing systematic reviews. But this was a study looking at um, reviews of Cochrane uh, collaboration and they found that there was clear evidence of publication bias in incorporating systematic reviews. Now, you might wonder, you know, what hope do we have uh, of other types of reviews done outside of the Cochrane if Cochrane reviews actually has uh, publication bias in it? Now, bear in mind that the reason why this issue is important that every single evidence-based guideline 
start with a systematic review of the evidence, right? So if clearly the evidence that we are relying on has all these biases, what hope do we have that uh, it, will get, it will help us really practice better in ways that will optimize outcomes? Nine, uh, significant findings tend to lead to overrepresentation of p-values in the abstracts of press releases. It's very, very rare that you'll find a trial that is not uh, significant that it gets a myriad media coverage. I mean, a very good example is uh, one of the recent uh, uh, media hype about the colchicine trial in COVID. Um, the trial was not significant on the primary outcome, which is the composite of hospitalization and mortality. It was significant on the individual components of mortality and hospitalization. That's all you hear about in the media and in the coverage. Uh, the fact that it wasn't, it was not significant on the primary outcome was not even mentioned in any of the press releases. So this is an issue of spin, um, and uh, it's a bit unfortunate because uh, you know when people focus on things that are statistical significance rather than things that were the primary purpose of doing the study, it's really what brings distortions, uh, and it's really at the root uh, of this problem. P-values have many, many conceptual problems uh, and limitations. And part of it is because it's a very indirect measure of the evidence for or against any null hypothesis. This is Frank Harrell, one of our colleagues in the US who has really kept um, a litany of problems with P-values. Uh, you can follow him on his website uh, because um, he's really listed all many things, too many things about P-values. Frankly, Reliance on p-values has more challenges than I'll be able to discuss within this short time. Um, there has been an ongoing debate about what to do with statistical significance or p-value thresholds. This actually was led by the American Statistical Association in 2016. They released a warning against misuse of statistical significance and p-values. And in their statement, it had six principles. Uh, the first one being they reminded people that p-values only tell you how compatible the data are with a specified hypothesis or model. They do not measure the probability that a studied hypothesis is actually true and therefore should not be used um, uh, to make, uh, you know, or thresholds about people should not be used to make uh, conclusions uh, or decisions uh, uh, at all. If anything, they were encouraging people really to provide full transparency in the reporting of the findings not just whether the p-value is um, significant or not significant. And again, there's a reminder that the p-value does not in any way provide information about the size of the effect, uh, if you're actually measuring effects, and certainly should not be used as good measure of the evidence. So these were the six principles that they were looking at. Now, following this, two years later, there was another group of practicing statisticians and trialists who came together and they said, well, we still can't get people to change practice. Maybe we should actually move uh, the goalpost from 0 0.05 to 0 0.005. Uh, this was published in Nature, Human Behavior. And of course, there was an, an accompanying editorial by John Ioannidis um, in JAMA, uh, which also thought maybe adoption of this proposal could actually help uh, change the way people practice science. But immediately after this proposal was brought up, there was a note of caution from another study that actually showed that, hang on a minute, this may not be a panacea. This was based on a simulation study says, yes, you might be able to reduce the false positive conclusions by moving the level of significance, but this often led to increased overestimation of significant effects. So certainly wasn't going to help. So then about uh, January of 2019, there was another group of statisticians uh, that came together and said, all right, that solution doesn't work. What else can we actually try and get people to do to be able to practice better and not misuse statistical significance? And the American Statistical Association dedicated um, a whole edition of one of their journals, the American Statistician, to this issue. They called it Statistical Inference in the 21st Century a world beyond P less than 0 0.05. And in the editorial of the, the volume, the editors even gave a caution that people should stop saying something is statistically significant. When I give a talk, I often ask people, 
before COVID. I said, please raise your hand if in any of your scientific writing, you're never gonna say something is statistically significant or something is significant, period. I've never had a single person raise their hand, which didn't surprise me uh, because even some of the people who have really strongly advocated getting rid of it, they continue to practice um, um, you know, science and see some of their reports with P values still reported. Aha, so P uh, voicing out their displeasure with statistical significance is increasing. Now we have over 800 people who've signed up to this. Fortunately, um, I was not one of them. Um, I don't even know how this campaign began, to be honest. Um, so this generated even more debate. It was published in editorial coverage in different uh, scientific magazines uh, with lots of people arguing on both sides. Saying, you know what? This is a sensible and practical. If we retire statistical significance, we give him bias a free pass. This is John again. And I keep bringing John because he's dedicated a lot of uh, his efforts in really trying to see how we can make science reproducible because we depend so much on reproducibility uh, to be able to make advances. When you think about it, uh, this issue of replication or reproducibility, um, in a single study, we do it in several patients, we call it a study, but we know that a single study is not good enough. We need to replicate the same study in different settings. That's why replication is important. So John said, typically when a study comes up, it reports statistical significant findings, it gets all the attention, people then start scrutinizing uh, the, the study and uh, look at the methods and so on. But now if we're not even gonna know whether it was significant or not, because people won't say anything, uh, well, they're gonna get rid of it. We will not be able to actually be a letter to papers that may actually have terrible methods and therefore whose findings we shouldn't trust. And of course, uh, this is calling back another colleague in the US who said, the problem is not the p-value, it's human behavior. Right? All scientists, we tend to have the propensity to believe our own theories and anything that uh, we do, you know, whether it's uh, the conduct of science or reporting, uh, we often try to do it in a way that really supports those theories. And of course, uh, academic institutions and journals and the media help us to hype uh, the findings uh, whenever they actually tend to support those um, theories. To be honest, it's quite unlikely that practice will change anytime soon. Um, but, you know, there's some journals actually that try to take steps to see whether they could actually ban p-values uh, in, the, in, in, their, um, in their journals. Um, this were two papers. And guess what? Um, if you actually get rid of p-values, people start abusing something else. So there's really empirical evidence showing that getting rid of p-values is not going to solve problems, right? If anything, people will find something else to abuse. But I was wrong uh, because the New England Journal of Medicine uh, was perhaps the first journal um, that said they were going to change their guidelines on statistical reporting in response to all this debate. Um, and then I looked at, okay, what exactly are they changing? Um, the only thing I could find that was substantial, I mean, substantially different from what they had in their previous guidelines was that people should replace p-values with both point uh, and confidence interval estimates when the protocol nor the statistical analysis does not include adjustments for multiple testing. To me, it didn't look like uh, much of a difference anyway. I think the change will only require the complete overhaul of our educational system and academic culture. We still live in an academic culture that really encourages bad behavior among scientists. Um, uh, which is a bit unfortunate. Uh, so, and this is really in agreement with uh, what Colin has said is that the problem is, you know, we scientists, you know, we believe our theories. And then of course we have academic institutions that get the glory from uh, the fame that their scientists bring and so on and the journals and the media, everybody uh, jumps on the back wagon, um, when, uh, you know, propagated this type of uh, behavior. All right, certainly you know, there must be other things we could do to try and uh, at least um, you know, encourage better practices that don't rely so much on p-values. Uh, 
and this has been some of uh, the suggestions that others have put forward. The first being really the adoption of the concept statement and its extension uh, in how we report uh, studies, particularly in trials. The concept extension was actually first published in 2019, uh, uh, actually 1996, and this was the second edition which came in 2010. And if you look at really the concept uh, statement, which was really about reporting of randomized controlled trials, it doesn't talk anywhere about uh, reporting p values. They talk about reporting estimates with confidence intervals. And if you look at all the extensions that's been extended to different types of interventions, different types of outcomes, uh, different types of uh, designs and so on, and everywhere they actually don't talk about um, p values, they talk about just estimated with confidence interval. We actually extended it to pilot and feasibility studies with a group of colleagues in the UK. And in our a statement of how they to extend this uh, reporting to uh, pilot trials, we actually deliberately uh, discourage reporting of p-values. Why? Because pilot and feasibility studies uh, are not intended to assess statistical significance. They are actually primarily designed for assessing feasibility and estimates of effect are a secondary issue. And therefore we discourage, deliberately discourage people reporting p-values of significance for pilot and feasibility studies. Now we could also ask or encourage people to focus more on clinical relevance instead of p-values, which is statistical significance. And this is really one of the studies that I showed like when we design studies, we tend to actually have the minimum clinically important difference in mind. And therefore, when we have the findings, we can look at where uh, the minimum clinically important difference we used to design a study is relative to the confidence interval of the estimate. And depending on where it's located, we could say there's definite, probable, possible, or definitely not uh, clinical importance uh, of the finding. Now, let me remind you that the concept of minimum clinically important difference was actually uh, a phenomenon or a concept that was created at McMaster. Uh, with many of our colleagues, uh, Roman, Joel Singer, and Gordon Guyatt, who were really part of this movement in the 80s. Now, we could also uh, consider abandoning p-value thresholds or use of statistical significance. If you look at the editorial that John wrote for JAMA, he had a long list of things that, you know, we could lower the p-value threshold. I've already seen, we've shown you that it's not a solution. It won't work. We could abandon p-value threshold and just report the p-value itself and not worry about whether it's above or below some threshold. Or we could abandon p-values altogether, or we could use alternative um, methods such as the Bayesian methods named after reference base. Or we could just report on estimates of effective confidence intervals. Or if none of these things work, take everybody back to school and um, you know, train them much better in terms of really how they need to approach science. Uh, so there's lots of things we could do. Now, in clinical significance um, or clinical relevance, it's a difficult concept for most people because even uh, in a particular discipline, um, you know, people working in the same area tend to have their own thresholds of what is really clinically important. But there have been other dimensions of clinical importance or relevance that have been advanced by others such as patient importance or patient significance, um, which is you know, what is significant to the, the person that uh, has to actually make the decision or patient centeredness, uh, which is really um, you know, doing things and measuring things that are really um, centered around patient needs. Um, we have had the concept of patient orientationness um, in CIHR, um, which really is also another dimension of uh, looking at this issue. Now, this is Richard Pito, who we recently uh, lost, um, and he used to talk about another concept of humanly important um, effects. And you can learn more about it um, in the book, Treatment of uh, Early Breast Cancer. As my final thought, I'll say to you, statistical thinking really is very closely linked with evidence-based thinking. It's all about how to uh, consume information in the most optimal way, to be able to make better clinical decisions. Um, we don't need statistical significance uh, to think statistically for sure. However, one would argue that we need clinical relevance to be evidence-based and ideally 
you know, what you're hoping is you will not be faced with a situation where something is not statistical significance, it's also not clinically important, which could actually be seen as waste of resources, which is why when we design studies, we really want to make sure that we optimize both dimensions. Um, if it's not statistical significance, but it's clinically important, perhaps it's not totally useless uh, because it still has some clinical relevance. But if it's statistical significance, but it's not clinically useful, one would argue that what's the purpose, right? Ideally, this is where we want to be, but how often do we often get there? To be honest, um, I think really what we need is a complete shift away from this binary thinking and put more emphasis on education. Not to say that people haven't been trying, um, but it is a challenge. And I think many of these things really are a consequences of not um, putting more emphasis on educating people about critical thinking, um, statistical thinking, uh, which is really a way to think about information and the basic concepts of epidemiology and fundamentals of research methods. Um, also teaching people about transparent reporting of research is uh, very rarely would you find a graduate course or even course on anything that really emphasizes the importance of reporting of findings. A uh, peer review process, um, you know, people may think that when something is peer reviewed, it must be good. Actually, no, we have lots of uh, rubbish that's actually published because a peer review process uh, they really needs to be improved as well. We need to do more training of peer reviewers, including editors. Lots of editors um, are still not well trained about best practices. Certainly, we need balanced interpretation of findings because context matters. Uh, and therefore, relying on statistical significance alone without full understanding of the context is not helpful. And then as we take this evidence and we apply it to practice, um, you know, there's principles that we also need to adhere to of how we now take the best available evidence and put it in practice. And of course, we do really need to educate our lay press about how to cover science and do it in a way that really provides accurate information to the public. Now, the tragedy of poor research and misguided focus on PVLs, unfortunately, can have very deadly consequences on our public health system. You guys may have heard of the controversy between the MMR vaccine and missiles. Now, we've seen this type of headlines before that measles outbreak, this was before COVID and so on. And this started as a result of a study that was published in 1998 in The Lancet, one of the most the top medical journals um, that's based in the UK. Now, if you look at the study uh, on the internet, it has a red mark on it, retracted. It was retracted and I'll tell you more about the story. Now, what was the study claiming? It was claiming that there's a causal link between the vaccine and development of autism in children, right? And autism really is a, the spectrum where you know kids have difficulty communicating non-verbally or relating with others uh, and thinking and behaving in ways that are not conventional. However, there was overwhelming evidence to the contrary that there was no link between um, MMR and autism. This was um, one of the systematic reviews that was published in pediatrics. There was another one published. There was a Cochrane systematic review. Almost all of them were clearly uh, universal in the same message that exposure to this vaccine was unlikely to be associated with development of autism. Let me tell you a little bit about the study. It had 12 patients in it. It was really not a randomized control trial, um, but there was a group of comparator uh, children in it, and I'll come back to it. But the nature of the conclusions were actually very speculative, not supported by the evidence. And I'll explain what I mean by that. And there were other serious ethical violations that you know, the no consent and no ethical clearance to actually do this study. But I have to say, by far, the greatest damage that was done by this study uh, was really, um, you know, the uh, reporting of the p-value of the test of association of receiving the vaccine and um, what they call urinary melatonic uh, acid, which uh, the investigators used as a marker of autism. Right. Now, this was a graph that was reported in, in one of the books. Uh, I mean, in the paper. And it reported a p-value that is very significant comparing uh, 
the levels of this acid in the patients that um, were suspected to have autism and a control group of children that did not have autism, but they had very low levels of uh, this acid. There is no good information that seems to suggest that having low levels or uh, of this one is actually indicative of autism. In other words, there's no information to support that this is a good surrogate marker of autism. If anything, um, many people would actually still say, look, if you have lower levels of vitamin B12, you could have uh, lower levels of this acid. Now, so as part of the findings in the abstract, guess what you see? Only a p-value that is highly significant is reported, right? But the seeds of doubt and confusion had already been planted uh, with serious implications for public health. This was vaccine coverage uh, in England before and after the study was published. Uh, Wakefield was from England and the study was published in England. Before the study, our coverage was well above 90. Um, but immediately when the study got published, it plummeted until it was actually below 80%. So you, you can imagine really uh, how serious uh, this issue had become. Fast forward to 2019, this was the number of missiles cases rising in the US. And by the way, it was also rising in Canada because of the anti-vaccine movement. Um, people never thought we would be living in the era of fake news and uh, social media uh, with misinformation that now this anti-vaccine movement is alive, right? As of December of 2019, they had about 1,282 cases, uh, which was a monthly thing that was going on. Now, if you think the situation in the US was bad, if you go across the Atlantic to the Democratic Republic of Congo, it is absolutely catastrophic, right? This was before COVID. There was headline after headline that missiles outbreak was spreading like wildfire in the Congo region, but nobody was paying attention. Of course, now nobody even paid attention at all, we're all paying attention to COVID, right? Now, to understand the impact of what missiles was actually doing there, you have to think about what Ebola had done uh, in the same region. So Ebola had killed about 4,000 uh, people at that time, right? Uh, no, actually Ebola killed about 21,000. Um, and at the time when this article was written, um, actually, you know, missiles had killed close to 4,000 children. And we're talking about children here. Uh, this was a report uh, from WHO. Now, as of January of last year, when I was tracking, over 6,000 children had died from missiles. Now, we have to be fair because really the outbreak of missiles in the Congo is lack of resources and, and limited access to care. It's not really because of fake news. At least we can't prove that it's because of fake news. But my argument, uh, the reason why I raise this issue is because honestly, the rest of us and the world, instead of us fighting the spread of missiles in developed countries because of fake news and so on, we could be using all those resources to be helping countries like the Democratic Republic of Congo, right? But we continue to fight the anti-vaccine movement, all of which is actually fired up by that article that was actually debunked and retracted. In fact, the CBC actually had a marketplace program where they were talking about this anti-vaccination movement. And I was actually shocked to realize that actually the author of that article, um, Wakefield, was actually still in the forefront of this movement. And even now, as we actually start vaccinating people for COVID, the anti-vaccine movement is up and alive. And we recently heard that actually they have closed down um, one of the vaccine sites in LA um, this week. So this is really a big problem that we're facing. Anyway. Statistical significance certainly is different from clinical relevance, um, but there's other dimensions we can think of, um, of really as to how we uh, optimize um, information, such as personal significance, patient orientation, or patient importance, or something that may be humanly important. Of course, this push of dethroning or getting rid of statistical significance, you know, there's merit to it, but we've also seen that there's evidence showing that if we get rid of it, something else will come up. Um, perhaps we can re-intensify our efforts of educating people rather than really getting rid of it. Certainly more emphasis on confidence intervals in how we report interpret results 
um, can provide a lot more or better information by just relying on statistical significance. With this, I will say thank you for listening and I will stop right here. Dr. Tabani, thank you for that informative talk. It was really interesting and really makes us think because I feel like we can all testify that the majority of our focus when we are reading a paper is on the p-value. And it's quite shocking when we realize that there are all these other factors that we are not educated on and they're, they're probably more important than the p-value. Uh, with that being said, we have a few questions if you don't mind ask, um, mind me asking, I'm gonna sure. read them. Um, so Bilal is asking, uh, when talking about the p-hacking, how trying to find, uh, how trying to get more information until the p-value becomes less than 0.05, uh, why would that be a bad thing if getting more information uh, to get to the p-value of less than 0.05, wouldn't that be a stronger argument than if the p-value was 0.05? Um, so why is it bad to wait to reach to a significance level? Why would that uh, be called p-hacking and be frowned upon? All right. So one of the things that uh, we as humans are born with, which we wish it wasn't the case, is we are naturally biased by nature, which is why when we're trying to actually do anything, we tend to actually, uh, you know, do things that we are familiar with or go with people we are familiar with or go with people who look like us, who, who think the way we think and so on. Similarly, when we do science, don't forget that we do science because we believe that something is gonna work. And chances are, we are more likely to behave in ways that will actually prove ourselves right. We don't, we're not good police uh, at policing ourselves, which is why when we do studies, we actually have to do a protocol that, you know, describes how we're going to do the size and how we're going to interpret the size, everything, right? And make that public before we do the science to avoid the biases. The biggest problem we face when we do science is bias. The only way to get rid of it is to make sure that we set ahead of time what steps we're going to take, how we're going to take those steps, and why we're going to take those steps. If then when we start uh, looking at the data, we find we're not getting what we're seeing, and then we keep changing until we get what we're seeing, obviously that means we're introducing bias, uh, no matter how we can defend it. So the problem with that practice is it's introducing the bias that we are also trying to get rid of by actually doing better design of studies with protocols right from the beginning. So the easiest way of sabotaging the integrity of any study is to actually do data manipulations once you start looking at the data. Absolutely, that makes perfect sense. So we should have well-defined endpoints for studies before actually starting the studies, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. That makes sense. And also there's one more question that is, I think it's very interesting. So if you avoid using p-values to establish aesthetical significance, uh, wouldn't it be harder to standardize and significance for clinical studies? What other values can we use? What are the other solutions that we can utilize? All right. So the issue is, would it be harder to standardize? Now, bear in mind that we can report p-values without actually deciding whether it's below or above something. But you can provide it and report it and it's still useful information because it's telling you something about whether uh, the result that you're seeing um, you know, uh, can be explained by chance or not, right? So the problem is when we start seeing it's below and above something um, and then we have sometimes lots of those p-values to actually make the same decisions. Um, or sometimes uh, that's the only thing we're relying on, we're discussing all other information. So standardization, it is not the biggest problem we face, it's misuse of it. That's right. That's right, absolutely, that makes a lot of sense. Um, Dr. Tabani, just uh, a final word, what advice do you have to graduate students, uh, physicians, and even undergraduates that maybe don't have the necessary statistical understanding to analyze papers like this. Uh, for the next five years, what changes should be introduced to the educational system for scientists, graduate students, and medical doctors 
to be able to understand these papers better and take a deeper dive instead of just looking at the p-value. Of all the slides I've talked about, there's only one slide I would actually say is perhaps the most important slide and I'll go back to that slide and actually show it up, okay? Because, you know, honestly, this is perhaps the most important slide. Um, I would encourage anyone to actually, uh, let me just do this. I said critical thinking. There's nothing as important as critical thinking um, because it allows you not to be able to just accept the status quo. It's reported in the Lancet, it's reported in your England Journal of Medicine, therefore it must be true. It is absolutely important to train people to be critical about everything they see. And this is essential statistical thinking. All the elements of that really goes into how we think about statistical information, it's absolutely important to train everybody. And as you can see, it doesn't take much to actually train people about statistical thinking. Every citizen now knows, for instance, what it means to flatten the calf, right? Basic concepts of epidemiology, right? When it comes to issues of evidence, first we have to understand the basic things. And it really doesn't take much to actually train people on this. And basic research methods, because sometimes it doesn't take that much to actually realize that, oh, this is something nice that you look at it. But when you look at the method, sometimes they say, we actually randomize people. You may actually know they didn't actually randomize people. They were actually, uh, somebody was making a choice who goes there, who goes there, but they describe it as though it was a random process. So understanding the fundamental methods of actually how information is uh, or evidence is generated, it's important. It is equally important to actually understand the best practices in reporting. Quite often when I talk to graduate students, I'm not even talking about undergraduate students. I talk about whether they are aware of any reporting guidelines. They're not aware that there's reporting standards for various types of research, various types of designs and various types of disciplines. So being aware of the recommended standards of how to report things is essential. Peer review process, right? Just because something is published, it's important to be aware that it doesn't necessarily mean that it's good because we have lots of deficiencies in peer review process. Now, what should you do as a scientist? Get yourself trained about how to be a best peer reviewer. And of course, then you can have whatever your favorite journal is to make sure that your favorite journal has best peer reviewing processes where you always have a methodologist to actually not just look at the uh, clinical aspects of the research, but you look at the methods aspect of the research. Interpretation is absolutely important. You know, there's, there's absolutely no research that is perfect, will never happen. There's always issues of plus and minuses, you know, limitations here and there. Why? Because anything that's done by humans will always have human limitations. And it's always important that once we interpret things we take into account all the potential biases that could have come in, even if we didn't intend for these things to happen, simply because we're human. Evidence-based practices, it's amazing how uh, doctors trained at McMaster um, in the same program, same everything, but they practice differently. And it's simply because of you know, all the different pressures that each of them may face and the different preferences um, that come in, whether it's for patients, or the doctors themselves. So understanding the basic principles of what is the best optimal strategies of actually practicing medicine and how to optimize it. And certainly being aware that uh, just because, you know, it's being covered by CNN and everybody else, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's actually true. It may very well be false because even the press or the lay press themselves, they're not educated about this thing. So it's important that one pays attention to press reports and make sure that, to me, I say, this is the best way we can actually help ourselves um, by making sure that we're as educated as we can, and then we'll be able to help others get educated. Now, I haven't gone to 
the issue of actually how we change academic culture. Why? Because, boy, that's a mountain to climb. Absolutely, absolutely. So I feel like just approaching papers with a level of a skepticism, that could definitely go a long way. Yes. Perfect. Uh, so my friend Simran has a question right now, and it's a live question, so she can just unmute herself and ask the question. Um, hello, so question was, uh, do you foresee more spin by researchers and consequently the media with less reliance on the p-value which previously has been set as a threshold for significance? Now, I, I, I think the question is, do I foresee more spin? Yes. Right? To be honest, you know, uh, it's hard to predict the future for anything, all right? But based on what we've seen to date, I have no reason to believe that this is going to change anytime soon. Yeah, unfortunately, with the pandemic, I think we saw quite a lot of a spin in the media and also the... Oh, yeah. well. I mean, it doesn't take much. Uh, a few days ago, there was so much hype about the Colchicine trial. Um, but the paper has not been published. Now, you can imagine that when the paper gets published and all the scientists look at it and they have issues with it, it's gonna be a hard time to convince anybody that there's something wrong with that trial, right? For sure, for sure. People will start reacting just by press release without the paper actually being peer reviewed. Yeah. So uh, my friend Moira has a question right now. Moira, do you wanna unmute yourself? Yeah. Hi, um, again, Dr. Cobain. Uh, so I just have uh, two questions. So the first one, um, I guess just maybe how grants and future projects would be funded if you're kind of moving towards relying less on statistics or like the p-value um, that might show that these new projects would be worth exploring kind of thing, just like how you think there'd be a shift in like applying for grants and, and getting funding and all that stuff. Yeah. It's a very good question. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, part of what we need to do is to actually educate our fellow colleagues uh, who sit on these grants to really understand the best practices of how to do science and therefore how to review grants. Um, remember that for proposals or grants, um, the focus is not so much on uh, statistical significance, rather on really estimating how much information to be able to detect a clinically important finding. So while statistical significance plays a role, it is not as, as paramount as it is when people start interpreting the findings. Right? But we still need to be able to educate people really to do a much better job. I often actually encourage people that when you are trying to design a study and estimate how much information we need is the so-called sample size issue, right? I say to them, don't estimate it at one threshold for statistical significance. Vary the threshold because you never know which threshold might actually work for the findings in the, in the, in the last, uh, in the end. Right? And it's to acknowledge the prevailing uncertainty that, um, you know, um, you could have a lot of uncertainty about the threshold that will work. You could also have fresh uncertainty about the minimum clinically important difference itself, you know, we never really know what it is. We often actually rely on estimates from studies which are equally as unreliable. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for answering. Just one more question, if you don't mind, um, kind of along these lines. So um, uh, you mentioned, like, you know, um, that it's, it's. I think you mentioned at the beginning or like somewhere in the middle um, where, you're not, where you asked um, people who had published before um, whether they stated that they had used um, statistically significant in their papers and whatnot. So kind of along those lines, um, how do you, um, how else would you emphasize then the gravity of like a certain issue in the medical community? So for example, um, that's like even with COVID, the disparities in the healthcare administration between different races and stuff, like how would, if you weren't relying so much on on p-values and, and using statistically significant, how would you kind of emphasize how severe like a certain issue or finding is? Confidence intervals. Mm -hmm. Confidence intervals tell you the magnitude of the differences if you're comparing between groups. Um, mm -hmm. So I think emphasis should be on the magnitude of the difference as captured by the confidence interval. Okay, all right, great, thank you so much. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Tabain, for, and my apologies for going over time. It's just such a pleasure to have you here.
and people were really excited to ask the questions. And we really want to thank you for your time, for your knowledge, and hopefully we're going to see more videos on the Demystify Medicine channel regarding this topic to educate the public more, furthermore, about this issue. You're welcome. Well, it's been a pleasure. Um, I hope to come back at some point. Okay, bye-bye, guys. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Take care. You're welcome.